And I'd like to invite you also to open in your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 16, absolutely one of my favorite sections of Scripture, if you're allowed to have a favorite that has personally ministered to you various times over the years. Most Christians have a few scriptures that sort of stand out in that regard. This is one of them for me. Psalm 16. Let's remember as we read this that these words are God speaking to us. They are God's words addressing us. He intends through these words to reach into our lives, into our schedules, even into our emotions, and compel our response that lasts beyond today and shapes us into the future. God himself is speaking to us. Let's begin reading. Psalm 16. A miktam of David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. And my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. My wife really doesn't like old elevators. Uh, She doesn't like them because apparently one point when she was traveling, she got stuck in one and no one knew where they were. Uh, So there was some elevator that stuck. I guess it was halfway up or down and they were just there in an elevator, completely vulnerable uh, to its safety and uh, uncertain when they would be rescued. And, and I can kind of understand that, actually, uh, whenever we come, especially to those, those really nasty old elevators they sometimes have in parking garages, uh, old parking garages where you just are uncertain uh, whether this thing is still rated for you know, any kind of serious weight. And so you get on and you, you, you know that experience where you, you step onto it and the whole thing kind of moves a little bit. Uh, it's disconcerting and there's, there's just cracks in the walls and it seems to, to quiver when the engine starts and you just begin to feel extremely vulnerable. And an elevator is a kind of a unique situation because you are literally entrusting your entire self into this metal box and these wires running up and down whatever height uh, the building is and whatever happens happens to the elevator is what's going to happen to you. So you're, you're entrusting yourself to it. So she doesn't like old elevators, rickety elevators, and I understand uh, there's something vulnerable about stepping into something like that. Well, well, well David describes a, a certain way of viewing God in this psalm that in some ways, in some ways, you could think of it as he's, he's declaring himself to have stepped into and under the care of the Lord. But for David, his opinion of God is ecstatic. It's delighted. He has no sense of vulnerability. He has similarly stepped into and under the protection of God, the care of God. But for David, he's delighted to be there. He doesn't feel vulnerable at all. He feels completely secure and safe, ultimately, 
because he is under the care of his God. And this whole psalm is basically David exulting and extolling and declaring his delight and his joy at being in the confines of of God's protective care. I think you could summarize this psalm this way. The servant of the Lord is delighting in the care of the Lord. The servant of the Lord delights in the care of the Lord. To be under God's care, to be held by the Lord, is for David a delightful experience. Not just necessary, not just accurate or right. It's delightful. I just want you to notice uh, the words of, of joy and delight that are present in this psalm. We'll just kind of run through it quickly. Notice this. He says in verse 2 that he has no good apart from the Lord. Then he says those who follow the Lord in verse 3 are all his delight. Then he says in verse 5, the Lord is his chosen portion in his cup. He has a, a beautiful inheritance in God. Then note down in verse 9, he says, because of these things, his whole being rejoices. And then we have the, the summary in verse 11, that in his presence, God's presence, there is fullness of joy and endless pleasure. So this is a joyful psalm. This is a psalm where David is saying, it is delightful to be in your care. To be under your care, my Lord, is my delight. I rejoice in it. And it's made all the more remarkable because we find out in verse 1 that there is something in the physical world, something in this world that causes David physically or from a human standpoint to feel his own vulnerability. Preserve me, O God. For in you I take refuge. We don't know what the trial was, and in some ways I think that's helpful. Something about this life had made David aware that on his own, in his own strength, he is suspended and he has, is vulnerable to some kind of fall. He's vulnerable to danger. And in his own strength, he needs help. He is not sufficient. So we have this opening prayer of, of protection. Preserve me, God. I take refuge in you. And then we have the next 15 verses of celebrating how delighted he is to trust God in the midst of this, humanly speaking, vulnerable moment. Humanly speaking, David feels vulnerable. Spiritually speaking, he is ecstatic that he belongs to God and that he is in the hand of the Lord. That's the, the wonderful uh, way this psalm works. You have this opening prayer of vulnerability, and then you have David declaring to the Lord how good it is to trust God when he feels his own vulnerability. But what a wonderful psalm this is. It, it just helps us, I think, by, by urging upon us this same delight and, and, and inviting us to evaluate our own lives. Do, do we delight... When, when we feel vulnerable in the refuge that God is, are, are we similarly rejoicing that God is our refuge, that he is our inheritance, that all that we have belongs to him, and that, that we ourselves are under his care and protection? It, it invites us to, to be like that and to see that as the right way to view God. Now, the themes in this psalm overlap and, and go back and forth across each other, but I'm going to try to break this psalm up into sort of three sections, and there'll be some, some repetition there, but three sections of, of revealing David's delight in the care of his God. All right, three sections. First of all, this delight, initially, it looks like a devotion to the Lord's supremacy. Point one, devotion to the Lord's supremacy. Notice he says, after his prayer, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. And then he begins to declare uh, why it is right for him to trust in God and why he hopes that God will protect him. He describes himself as a man who has entirely committed himself to the supremacy of his God. And in light of his commitment to God, his completely entrusting himself to God, declaring God as supreme, he hopes that God will fulfill his, his confidence and his trust by rescuing him. Notice this. He says in verse 2, I say to the Lord, that's God's covenant name. You'll see it throughout this psalm, Yahweh. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. You notice the slightly different uh, wording there. It's L, lowercase o-r-d. So he's saying, I say to Yahweh, you are my master, you are my sovereign. I have no good apart from you. 
So any good that David's going to have in his life is completely in the power of his God. The covenant God is the only source of any good that David will receive. And then notice, he says that this view of you, this view of your supremacy, it extends even to those who also love you and trust in you. As for the saints in the land, he says, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. What's David doing? He's saying, I I need you, Lord. I have no good apart from you. And, And let me remind you who is speaking right now. I am one who I so value you that even those who love you, they are the ones that I respect. I I, I view you as as so supreme over everything else that even it affects how I view other people. It it affects who I, I respect, who I delight in. I delight in those people who are set apart to you. The saints in the land, the holy ones, the ones who have dedicated their lives to the Lord, they are the excellent ones. And I delight in them. So remember, Lord, I I am not one who delights in the wicked people who reject you. I delight in those who follow after you. And then he compares in contrast in verse 4. Here's what I think, God, about those who reject you. Their sorrows will multiply. The sorrows of those who run after another God, they shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood, I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. He's saying, look, the idolatry of the pagans and their rituals, I I, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I want nothing to do with those who follow false gods. I want nothing to do with their practices. I want nothing to do with their way of trusting something other than God. I want nothing to do with that. You, Lord, are supreme. And anyone who follows someone besides you or something other than you, the only end that they will have is sorrow. The the ultimate and final end for those who seek another God besides you, God, it is sorrow. It is the opposite of joy. Notice the contrast here. David says, following you ultimately, in the end, it will bring joy. But rejecting you and following something other than you, what's it going to result in? Sorrow, he says. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I have no good apart from you. I delight in those that follow you. And anyone who rejects you, I believe that their end will only be sorrow. What's he saying? He's saying, Lord, I believe you to be so supreme. I am so dedicated to your supremacy over all things that it affects everything I I think about this life. I delight in you because you are better than anything else. I delight in those that follow you. I reject anything that would lead me away from you. I trust in you. And because I trust in you, Lord, fulfill my trust and preserve me. Brothers and sisters, if we would delight in the Lord, we also must be devoted like David to his supremacy over all things. We must be devoted to his supremacy. He is supreme over all things, and we can evaluate ourselves by these same two tests. Do we delight in those that follow God? Do we delight in them like, like David does? That's one of the ways he reveals his trust in the Lord, is that he, when he sees a, a, a holy one, someone who is following God, he just thrilled by that person. He calls them the excellent ones. I I delight in them. I'm so thrilled to see someone that is following God, that loves God more than anything else. Let let, let me speak to you. If if you just could evaluate, do you love being around people that are following God? Do you love hearing from them and listening to them talk and discussing God with them? Do you love learning from them? Is is there just a natural enthusiasm in your heart to be around those who delight in the Lord? Let me me speak this to young people. Look, look, if if you're under 20 years old, let me just say something to you very personally right now. If you're you're under 20, let me ask you to, to give yourself a test right now. Do you honestly, naturally enjoy listening to people who like talking about God? Do you honestly enjoy that? Is it a natural thing for you, like David says? He's not lying here. He's not saying, well, I guess I should like them, uh, so I will. He's saying he, he actually enjoys them. 
if you don't, if there is in your heart a distaste for godly fellowship, a disinclination, if it, let's just pick some words, maybe it comes to be, it's boring for you, or you, you just don't seem to get anything out of it, or it seems disinteresting, or you just can't find your, yourself, you know, motivated to be around Christians when they're talking about the Bible. You, you find any number of, of reasons to not be there. Listen, the, the root of that is not that you don't like people necessarily. The, the root of that is there's a diminished view of the glory of God's supremacy. David loves people who follow God because he loves God. And anybody that follows God, he finds great joy in them. So listen, if you're under 20, test your soul by this. If you don't love fellowshipping with God's people, then it's possible that the love of God has diminished from your heart. It's possible that it was never there. Let me say this to every Christian. Listen, the love of God's people is a major evidence that we love God. The love of God's people is a major evidence that we love God. If you find any number of reasons to not be with God's people, in public, in small group settings, in private, if there's a number of reasons why, why I just don't think I can be there, I'm, I'm tired, I'm, I'm, I'm weary, I'm going to be late uh, to meeting with someone or some group of people, I, I'm just not sure I can, I can get there on time, I, I don't, I'm not sure I get anything out of this. Listen, there needs to be a, a sobriety in our heart if there's a disinterest in meeting and gathering with the people of God. David is exhilarated by that because he sees God as supreme and he is delighted that there are people in the land that are following God too. Listen, uh, community group meetings are not intended to provide some you know, pr pri uh, uh, un unheard of revelation. Uh, we don't go to a community group meeting and think, well, if I don't hear something I've never heard before, it's going to be worthless. No, that's, that's not the point. The point is delighting and hearing the same kinds of things from people who are actually following God. This is also a test for how we view the actions and the lifestyles of those who are running away from God. Look, the major thing that comes to my mind when I read verse 4, honestly, is, is media. I, we're not surrounded by physical idolatry like David was. There's not like somebody in the street corner offering you, you know, a libation to Baal. I mean, it's not like you're going to get that offer, right? But, but you do have uh, the, the media world inviting you to participate in sinful activities, all manner of sinful activities, I inappropriate humor and, and inappropriate relationships and, and even just worldliness and, and celebrating materialism. All kinds of things scream at us from advertisements and from Facebook and from, from movies and television. Ooh, that's, that's, a, that's a thing I'd like to have and that's a thing I want. I mean, think, think about just the category of coveting in the media, and, and the invitation to covet <laughs> that is present with every advertisement. It's possible that as we engage in this world, we, we don't have quite the same firmness in our soul that David says, I will not participate in the evilness of those who love things more than God. I will not do it, David says. Why? Because I delight in the Lord. And he is my refuge. And I'd rather belong to him and that he belongs to me than anything else. And when I think about my heart, even this week, and, and the number of times that I'm, I'm wanting things more than I want to want God, and I'm justifying them. They're not too bad. They're not that sinful. But I'm not sure I have David's zeal. I reject anything that would turn me away from you because I delight in you, O oh Lord. I have no good apart from you. David is devoted to the Lord's supremacy. It affects how he views fellowship. It affects how he views the evil <laughs> interests of this world. He's devoted to it. That's one way he reveals his delight. He's also grateful for the Lord's provision. Look down there, if you would, at verse 5. He contrasts in verse 5 himself with those who have been uh, taking drink offerings of blood. David says, I, I have a different kind of portion in verse 5. 
He's grateful for the Lord's provision. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Keep your eyes down there on those words. Let that sink in. The Lord, he says, Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, is my chosen portion and my cup. This is banqueting language. To to have a a chosen portion is, is that part of the meal that you would most like to have. And David says, let me tell you what, my, my thing that I most like to have, it's God. The thing that I most like to have, my, my, my preferred portion, it's God. And, and he's my cup. He sustains me. He refreshes me. He's my party, David could say. You want to know how I like to party? It's delighting in God. And then he changes the metaphor and he goes geographical. He holds my lot. You remember when the people of Israel came into the promised land and God apportioned lots for them, sections of land that he was giving them as a gift that they did not earn, but he wanted to bestow on them as a blessing. And David is saying, what I have received in the Lord is delightful. I have a beautiful inheritance. And I think if you combine these two metaphors, David does something interesting here. He starts by saying, the Lord is my portion. The Lord himself is my portion. And then he says, I have a beautiful inheritance. It's almost as though David is saying, yes, my, my life, the, the life that God has given me, I, I believe to be an, an evidence of his goodness. I see his goodness in what he has given to me. But he's also subtly using priest-like language here. If you know your Old Testament, you know that the, the Levite priests were not given a large plot of land like all the other tribes. They weren't given a big plot of land. They were told, your inheritance is the Lord, directly. And so David, I think, in saying the Lord is my portion, is, is subtly aligning himself with the priests and saying, my inheritance is good, yes, but there's also a sense in which my inheritance is God. And in an even more profound way, that is precisely the case for every person who belongs to Jesus Christ. The New Testament makes it very clear that every Christian has been made into a priest because they belong to Jesus. Uh, To be a priest was to have this this special access to God, this ability to approach God and claim him in a unique way as your very own, to claim him in a unique way as your provider and your inheritance. And that is the gift for every Christian. If you are a Christian, you can say like David, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Why? Well, because God has given himself to me as my inheritance, that in Christ Jesus, the Lord himself belongs to me, and my final inheritance is him his new land in heaven. So when David is saying, I have a beautiful inheritance, he's not just saying, my trees have been growing nicely and I have nice shrubs. He's looking beyond that to say, I I have an inheritance beyond any human calculation. The Lord himself is my portion. And I delight in what he has provided for me. He, He also provides counsel and direction in the uncertainties of this life. Notice in verse 7, I bless the Lord, David says. Again, notice the the language of worship here. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me. The night is that time of uncertainty and doubt and suspicion. And and David says, no, I, I receive instruction even at night. The Lord protects me. And because I have set the Lord before me, because I do not take my eyes away from him and I trust in him, here is my certainty. I shall not be shaken. I shall not be shaken. The Lord is is not this thing that will quiver under my feet. He, He is not this thing that I need doubt or have uncertainty about the future. The Lord is this thing that is secure, that is certain, that will hold me up. David says, you are before me. You will guide me. You will hold me up. You have provided yourself. You have provided an inheritance. And you have provided security for the way that I walk. The Lord is with me, David says. He is grateful for the Lord's provision. Christian, this is true of you. This is true of you. 
Because Jesus Christ claimed us for himself and united us to himself, the Lord is also our provision and our protection. And because he is with us, our souls also will not be shaken. Listen, humanly speaking, remember verse 1, David felt his own vulnerability. You ever feel your own vulnerability? I do. I did this week. I, I felt my own vulnerability. I, a certain thing I was facing, I just felt helpless in. There's, there's nothing I can do to change this situation, and it's a painful situation. It's suffering. It's hard. Lord, I don't like it. I want to do something to stop this. I'm vulnerable, I'm suspended, and I'm helpless, and I fear a plunge to destruction, and there's nothing I can do. Help me, Lord. David says, because you are at my right hand, I will not be shaken. He's grateful for the Lord's provision, the Lord's protection. He, the Lord provides himself as our protection. Brothers and sisters, do we delight in the Lord as our inheritance? Have we set the Lord before us? Look, listen, if I could just share a pastoral burden. Perhaps the major reason that we chose to preach an extended series in the Psalms is because we are concerned and eager that our church not be complacent in our private devotion with the Lord. So if I can urge upon you, ask this question. Does your weekly pattern of communion with God, your daily pattern of communion with God, does our, our daily pattern of communion with God describe a, a delightful inheritance, a setting the Lord always before us? Let me urge this on us. This is, this is not something you have to work your way up to. You can begin today if it's not the case. You can begin tomorrow. But be honest with yourself and ask the question, a Christian is intended to live in the presence of God, to live in fellowship with God, to claim God as his inheritance, to say with David that I have always set the Lord before me, that he is my counselor at night, and his mercies are new for me in the morning, and I delight in him and no other, and I will cling to him every day. Christian, is that your daily experience? If it is not, let me earnestly urge you to change whatever you have to change to make that the case. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to know everything about every verse of the scriptures. We just mean opening the scriptures or turning it on and beginning to read, beginning to listen, beginning to pray. Listen, if it's been months or years since you had a private practice of communing with the Lord, let me urge you, make this day a starting point. Resolve to not allow God to be a distant second in your daily calendar. Resolve to not allow God to be a distant reminder or a weekly occasion. Resolve to allow God to be your inheritance and your portion and your very great reward because that is what Jesus died to give us. There is nothing more important in our lives right now than prioritizing regular fellowship with the Lord. There is nothing more important in my life right now than prioritizing regular fellowship with the Lord. And you know that if we drink deeply of that fellowship, we will eventually begin to experience the joy that David describes. If it's not been a pattern, it will take some time to regain the taste of the Lord because perhaps we've been tasting other things. But it will break through and joy will be the result. David is grateful for the Lord's provision. Finally, he is confident in the Lord's preservation. Notice in verse 9, the result of his confidence in the Lord, the result of the Lord being his inheritance, the result of all of these things is that his heart is glad. Listen, if 
in an indefinite period of time. I'm not talking about momentary happiness or the giddiness of a certain moment in your life. I'm talking about long-term joy. If that is lacking in your life, one significant place to look is whether your soul has been made happy in God. Are there seasons of depression? Absolutely. Do we experience fickle emotions that condemn us and and send us in all manner of direction? Yes, they do. But if there is a long-term, enduring, unchanging sense of sadness in your life, one place that I would counsel us to look as a pastor is I would look here and say, I am intended by God to experience joy in his presence. Perhaps not joy in my circumstances. Perhaps not joy in my health. Perhaps not joy in my fellowship. Perhaps not joy in my family. But joy in God, certainly. My heart is glad, David says. My whole being rejoices. And remarkably, my flesh even dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. Oh, what a verse. What a verse. Now, Now, perhaps in the immediate sense, David is thinking of some immediate physical danger of which he faced many. Uh, perhaps the king was hunting his life again or somebody else was trying to kill him or his own son was trying to kick him out of the palace. I mean, maybe it was an immediate situation where he's saying, I don't believe you're going to abandon me uh, to death in this situation. But the New Testament writers perceive that David saw even better than he knew in this moment. And and an important point about biblical interpretation, we always want to let God interpret his own word. It's always best. Listen, uh, there's parts of the Bible very confusing, tricky to understand, especially parts of the Old Testament. But listen, if there is a section in the New Testament that tells us how to interpret a section in the Old Testament, uh, that absolutely gets the authoritative word. God gets to interpret himself. Before anybody else gets to, God gets to. And according to God, through the mouth of Peter, we find out that this very verse was intended by God to anticipate an even greater anointed one. Perhaps David meant only a a temporary provision. But, But Peter thinks, and behind him we know, God is declaring that this verse was prophetic. It was pointing ahead to an even greater king. And here's why that's important for us, because we don't have kings, and so we don't think this way very often. But in the Old Testament, the way the king went was the way the people went. All right, they didn't have this democratic situation where you can all kind of seek your own life. W- what happened to the king was going to happen to the people. He was a representative. They were connected to him. They were under his banner. He was, as the Psalms say, their shield. So whatever was true of the king was going to be true of the people. And so for David to pray, don't abandon your king anointed one, your king, into the place of the dead. Don't let his flesh see corruption. He is, even in this moment, also praying for the people, because what happens to him will ultimately result in those that are under his protection. And Peter says, there's an even greater king of which that will be even more profoundly true. Listen to this. David quotes This psalm, when he stands up at Pentecost after the Holy Spirit falls and begins to preach, he opens up the Bible and he begins to quote this psalm. And he says this, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and in his his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet... And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So how do we interpret this, allowing Peter and God to tell us? Well, he Basically, it's this way. David saw, at some level, a limited truth in which God was going to preserve him through many enemies, and you can read about that in in 1 and 2 Samuel, the provision and protection of David. However, however, 
God intended through the mouth of David to declare there is an even greater king who quite literally will not have his flesh rot in a grave. And in the life of that king, there will also be safety for his people. You will not abandon that anointed one's soul to Sheol. You will not let your holy one see corruption. The ultimate anointed one, the ultimate Messiah, which is what it means, the anointed one, the Messiah, the ultimate Messiah, the protector and savior of his people, would not see corruption. And because the people are always connected to the king, they will not see final corruption either. Because this king will be Raised. David, David perhaps was thinking, look, you're going to raise me up, and, and that's going to result in life. But Jesus was raised up, the ultimate anointed one. He was raised up. He was not allowed to see corruption. And in him, through union with him, the prayer of David is true of us, not just temporally, but eternally. So we can say, because we belong to Jesus, we have stepped into the carriage of Christ. Where in our own strength, there was only a plunge to damnation. But in Christ, the one who did not see corruption because he paid the penalty of sinners and death had no claim over this guiltless sacrifice. Because death could not claim him, he cannot claim anyone who belongs to him and has stepped into his protection. Because Christ is our anointed one and because we are linked to him, we can say Christ can no longer succumb to the curse of death. And because we are in Christ, where the elevator goes, the people in side go. You make known to me the path of life, even as Jesus said, you know the way and the truth and the life. Have I been with you so long, he said to his disciples, and you do not know me. You make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is, what? Fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. In Christ now by faith, with Christ then by sight, and at your right hand. At your right hand are what? Pleasures forevermore. Delights, joys, rejoicings, a soul overwhelmed with the glory of it beyond our human capacity to understand. There is joy in Jesus Christ for all who belong to him, for all whose sins were crushed on that cross and who were united to him in his death and resurrection. We have stepped into the carriage of Christ, are carried to the right hand of God, and the sting of death cannot puncture us any longer because we belong to him, and where he goes, we go also. Brothers and sisters, walking with God is no longer walking towards God in an attempt to earn his favor. It's walking in Christ with all the security that Christ has, having conquered death and overcome our sins. It's the assurance of joy evermore in heaven and joy now by faith as we have communion with him. Listen, brothers and sisters, we must be those who can say with David, Lord, you have made known to me the path of life. Indeed, you are the way and the truth and the life. And all who believe in you, though they perish, yet will they live and they will experience experience joy with you forevermore. David covered and protected the people for a while. But Jesus covers and protects the people forever. I rejoice, David says, full of joy and great glory. Listen, brothers and sisters, let me urge us, there is more joy to be found delighting in the care of God revealed in Jesus than anywhere else. If you are in Christ, if you are 
living within the carriage of Christ and being carried to the very throne room of God, then whatever quivering causes you to pray, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge, allow it to be drowned out by the joy of your future, the joy of your inheritance. If you are facing sorrows at home, sorrows with children, sorrows with finances, sorrows with health, sorrows with marriages, remember the joy of the Lord has covered you in Christ and will deliver you into his presence forever. Let that joy define your daily routine. Let it define how you relate to those quivering moments of life. Listen, we are all in this together. All of us have quivering moments. Why is that happening? I had a moment this week where I thought, I can't believe it. I can't believe that's happening. You know what David says? Preserve me, O God. In you I take refuge. I have no good apart from you. I love those who love you. I will not turn away towards false gods in this moment of temptation. You are my portion. You are my inheritance. What you have given me is is good, Lord. It is delightful, and I rejoice because of that. And ultimately, because your anointed one did not see corruption, I will have joy in you forever. And I will define this quivering moment by that absolute security. The servant of the Lord and those who are united to him by faith delight in the care of the Lord in every quivering moment of life. Let's pray. Father, I pray for those that are aware of a temptation this week that they gave into. And it's coming to mind, Lord, some, some alluring call of sin, or coveting selfishness, lust, pride, arrogance, lying, Lord, something that drew them away. I pray, Lord, that as they confess that sin to you, you would remind them of the forgiveness that we have in Jesus right now. And you would restore their joy in fellowship with you right now. Well, we've come together as a church. We, we are an imperfect people, and we need your spirit to remind us that because of Christ, we are forgiven and we walk freely in fellowship with you. Lord, I pray for any here who have chosen and endured a long season of neglecting walking with you in private. Lord, I pray that you would shine on their heart right now, your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. I pray that they would even today, this week, open your word, commune with you, strengthen them for that task. Lord, I pray that you would enliven our fellowship with those that love you, that we would love those that love you, we would love being around them. Lord, and I pray for any who have been trying very hard to find some meaning in life outside of you. Lord, I pray that you would grab a hold of them, fix their gaze on you, and rescue them from the emptiness of life in this world. But we ask you all these things as a church that belongs to you and Lord, has been only purchased by your blood and is confident in your mercy that is always new. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.